Yeah, ahoy everybody. Um, thank you so much for organizing this great conference. So I would like to talk to you about an interesting and maybe surprising psychological phenomenon, which is called dysrationalia. Dysrationalia is defined as the inability to think rationally despite having adequate intelligence. Here's an outline of my talk. I will first introduce the subject and define the terms, in particular intelligence and rationality. And then I'll explain why I think rationality is really important for us personally, but also from an altruistic point of view. And then we'll have a closer look at the cognitive psychology of rationality or, and irrationality. And this is important and will put us in a better position to judge whether and to which extent we, we can actually improve human rationality. Let's start with the following quote. I'm also not very analytical, you know, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about myself, about why I do things. This quote is actually by former US President George Bush. <laughs> and it maybe represents general patterns in his thinking style, which I think soon after he became president, a lot of people realized were suboptimal in many aspects. And if we were to analyze from a cognitive from a cognitive psychological point of view, what exactly is wrong with Bush's thinking, we could come up with a long list, for example, such as the following, lack of intellectual engagement, cognitive inflexibility, need for closure, belief perseverance, confirmation bias, overconfidence, insensitivity to inconsistency, etc. So clearly, something is wrong with the way that Bush thinks. But when it was revealed that Bush actually has a really high IQ of 120, both supporters and opponents of the president were very surprised. <laughs> because 120, an IQ of 120 is actually a really uh, high IQ score. This is more than a standard deviation above the average. So how can we explain this? How can Bush be so intelligent on the one hand, but then clearly um, lacking very important cognitive thinking abilities on the other hand. And I think the reason why this is the case is because intelligence tests, they don't capture important aspects of what it means to be a good thinker. So what exactly do we mean by good thinking? Because generally in our society we assume that good thinking is the equivalent of intelligence. So we usually assume somebody who is a good thinker has a good, has a high IQ score, and somebody who's a bad thinker should score low on IQ tests and, has, and have a low IQ score. And whether we like it or not, intelligence actually plays a really important role in our society. It basically determines our careers, our professional and our academic careers. University admission, admissions, for example, they rely on intelligence tests, either explicit intelligence tests or proxies for intelligence tests, such as the SIT. Parents, they all want to have children with high IQ scores. So it's really something that plays an important role in our society, intelligence. But what exactly do we mean by intelligence? So there are many different ways of defining intelligence. And if, let's say, if we're talking about artificial intelligence, then we would maybe define intelligence in a similar way as we would define rationality, as we will see in a minute. But now, in the context of this talk, and for the sake of the argument that I'm making, we will just define intelligence as whatever IQ tests measure. Because this is the psychological construct of intelligence that actually plays a role in our society. Because this is how we measure it, and this is what we select for at university admission tests, for example. And IQ tests, they measure something um, which is basically the equivalent of cognitive capacity. So how fast you are at thinking, how fast and accurate you are at recognizing patterns, how efficient and how accurate your memory is, etc. And these are, of course, really important cognitive aspects. They, they really predict a lot. So IQ scores are actually one of the pow most powerful predictors that we have in psychology. It predicts your life, your, your success in life in general, your health, your life expectancy, the, the likelihood that you will end up in prison or not. So it's really something important, and I don't want to make the point that intelligence is not important. But IQ tests do not measure what cognitive sci scientists usually regard as or define as rationality. 
rationality is something somewhat different. Rationality is defined as being able to form accurate beliefs and being able to make the right decisions in, your in, in order to achieve your goal, whatever your goal is. So rationality is ultimately, rationality is goal neutral. So whatever it is you care about, um, rationality helps you in achieving that goal in the most effective way possible. And in the context of EA, of course, our goal is an altruistic one, and then we apply this rationality framework to an altruistic goal. So now, every systematic deviation from these normative models of rationality, of how we should think and how we should make decisions in order to form accurate beliefs and to achieve our goals, every systematic deviation from these models are called cognitive biases. So from psychology and from behavioral economics, we know that unfortunately humans do not decide and think perfectly rational all the time. We make a lot of mistakes, and these mistakes um, are called biases. Now, this is really interesting um, that it's really interesting that there's such a huge amount of research on cognitive biases throughout the last three to three, uh, three decades, but that this line of research has been almost completely separate from the research on intelligence or from the research on the assessment of intelligence. Now, there are really, as I mentioned, a lot of biases that have already been discovered. If you go to Wikipedia and type in list of cognitive biases, you'll find a huge list with dozens or hundreds of biases. And it's really interesting to, to scroll, scroll through that list because there are probably a lot of biases that you'll recognize. You might see, oh, this is a bias that my friend always shows, and that's another bias that I also see in other people often. Uh, but you should be careful because there's also a bias which makes you prone to um, identify or detect biases in others, but not in yourself. <laughs> so this is, it's called blind spot bias, and everybody has it. Well, at least you, I'm not sure if I have it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's really interesting to have a look at this, uh, to have a look at this list. So now let's have a look at two short brain teasers, two short qu uh, quizzes. So please try to answer this question for yourself. A bat and a ball cost $1.10 in total. The bat costs $1 more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? So please memorize your answer. We'll have a look at the correct answer in a minute. <clears throat> Here's the next question. Jack is looking at Anne, but Anne is looking at George. Jack is married, but George is not. Is a married person looking at an unmarried person? Yes, no, or it cannot be determined. Okay, let's take a look at the correct answers. The correct answer for the first question is five cents, but not 10 cents as most people actually think it is. Even 80% of Harvard students answer this, uh, this question incorrectly. <clears throat> so the reason why it's not five cents is, uh, why it's not 10 cents is because if the bat if the ball were to cost 10 cents, then the bat must call $1.10, because it must cost $1 more, and then the total will be $1.20. So the correct answer must be 5 cents, because in this case, the bat will cost $1.05, and then the total is $1.10. But most people answer this really simple question incorrectly, no matter how intelligent they are. And the reason is, it's because the way the question is phrased, our intuitive response is, is 10 cents, because this is just how it feels to us when we quickly read the question. But what we have to do is we have to overcome this first intuitive response, which seems correct but just isn't, and then think more deliberately about the question, then we'll find out what the correct answer is. And it's actually really simple to solve, of course. Now, the correct answer to the second question is A, yes, a married person is looking at an unmarried person. 
But most people here believe that C is correct, that we cannot determine what the whether a married person is looking at an unmarried person. So I also answered this question incorrectly when I first read it. And here again, most people, they just believe, well, we don't know whether Anne is married or not, so we don't know her marital status, therefore we cannot answer the question. So they just stop to think at this point. But if we think a bit more carefully about it, we'll realize that, well, okay, we don't know Anne's marital status, but there are just two possibilities. Either she is married or she's not married, and in both cases, the sentence is true. Because if she is married, then she is looking at George, and George is, George is not married, so the sentence is true. And if she's not married, then Jack, who is married, is looking at her, and in this case, the sentence is also true. So here, people fail to think disjunctively, meaning that they do not think in the hypothetical and reason through all the possible scenarios, because they just stop, because they are uncertain about um, what her marital status is. So the reason I showed you these two brain teasers is to illustrate how extremely bad we can be at thinking sometimes, no matter how intelligent we are. And <clears throat> now we've seen that both conceptually and empirically, IQ is not the same as RQ. So RQ would be a rationality quotient, a measurement a quantification of how rational we are and how good we are at forming accurate beliefs and making the right decisions. So how do we measure rationality? This is a really good question and there's not that much research yet on that question. Um, so far there, um, there, was a, there is a test called the cognitive reflection test, which is a really simple test and it just contains three questions, three items. And one of the items is actually the question with the bat and the ball that we looked at before. And then there are two other questions which are quite similar. And this simple test is actually a better predictor of people's, of people's performance in a wide range of thinking and decision-making tasks which measure to which extent people are able to overcome certain biases or not. So this simple test is a better, better predictor of people's performance in these tasks than all IQ tests. And even though there's like a huge amount of research and really sophisticated IQ tests, they are not so good at predicting people's thinking and decision-making skills. Um, now there is a researcher, a cognitive psychologist called Keith Stanovich, and he is um, doing really fascinating work on this type of research. In fact, many of the points I'm making now in this talk are based on his research. And he and his colleagues um, have been working on a a, a real RQ test, so a test which measures more comprehensively people's ability to think and decide rationally. This test is actually really recent. I think it was just published about a month ago, and it's called Comprehensive Assessment of Rational Thinking, CART. And this test measures many different aspects of what it means to be a rational thinker. For example, um, reflection versus intuition. So this is basically the same as the cognitive reflection test. This is one important aspect of what it means to be a rational thinker, to be able to overcome your first gut, gut reaction and think more deliberately if the gut reaction is wrong. But then also, in general, just the ability to overcome certain biases, such as framing effects, overconfidence, then the ability to think hypothetically. So remember the Anne and George example from before, where a lot of people fail to think hypothetically actively open-minded thinking, so the ability to um, be open-minded, to change your opinion in the light of new evidence, probabilistic reasoning, scientific thinking, so the ability to generate, generate alternative hypotheses, for example. These are all really important cognitive um, skills that are not me measured by intelligence tests. Okay, now Stanovich, Stanovich, found that if you measure people's IQs and their RQs, that there is only a very weak correlation be between the two. In fact, for some biases, there is no correlation at all or, only, or even a negative one. So for example, there's a bias called confirmation bias, which is our tendency to seek out for information or for evidence which confirm what we already believe, which confirm the hypothesis that we already hold. And here, Stanovich found that intelligent people might even be more prone to fall prey to this bias, and an explanation might be because they are 
much better and faster at finding the information that confirms what they already believe. So they're more prone to rationalize their beliefs. And this leads to this phenomenon that I mentioned, this rationalia. So because of this dissociation between intelligence and rationality, we can have people who, or there could, could be people who score high on IQ tests, but low on RQ tests. And yeah, Bush might be a good example of, of such a person. And yeah, maybe you've also already met people who maybe would classify as being disrationalic. Um, for example, if you, let's say if you talk to people about moral philosophy or about effective altruism, you may have noticed that there are some people who are really stubborn and don't and, and seem to have really weird objections that don't really seem to make sense and seem to be inconsistent with maybe other beliefs and premises that they usually hold. And in such a case, you might be dealing with somebody who would score low on an RQ test, but maybe in general is really intelligent and performs really well in other tasks. So why is rationality important? Um, I think it's almost by definition important, no matter what your goal is, as I said, rationality will help you to achieve that goal in a more effective way. So whether your goal is just to maximize money or uh, your personal happiness, or if it is an altruistic goal, being more rational and overcoming biases will, by definition, lead you to more systematically achieve what you care about. Now, in the context of altruism, and this is, of course, most relevant now in the context of this conference here, I also think that rationality is really important, and arguably it's even more important because much more is at stake. And unfortunately, unfortunately I think that irrationality literally leads to much more suffering than um, yeah, if we were more rational. So of course we all know that a lot of people don't really think so much when it comes to donating to charity, for example. A lot of people don't really consider it cost effectiveness, even though they should, and even though they would help many more people if they would consider cost effectiveness and donate their money to the most effective charity. And potentially, Cognitive biases also lead us to exclude certain individuals in our moral framework. Maybe it leads us to exclude, for example, non-human animals or future generations that we maybe would realize under more careful reflection that they should matter as well and that we should include them as well in our moral framework. Now, I just want to give <clears throat> one example of a bias in the moral context. This bias is called identifiable victim effect and it describes our tendency to be more willing to help an individual that we can identify, that we can relate to, whose name we know and whose face we see, than <clears throat> individuals that we cannot easily identify. So there are several studies which demonstrate this effect. One study goes as follows. There are three different gr groups of people and they all receive a leaflet with um, that advertises for a charity, and then they're being asked to donate to this charity. The first group of people, they receive a leaflet with statistical information about the charity. So, for example, with the amount of people who are at risk and the, the amount of people you can save per dollar, for example. The second group receives a leaflet that doesn't show any numbers, any statistics, but it just shows a photo and a story of a little girl and the name of the girl, but nothing more. And the third group re receives a leaflet that shows a combination of both. Now, how much do people donate? As you can guess, here we see the identifiable victim effect. People donate twice as much when they just see the photo and the name of the girl. And you could now, I think it's plausible to say that um, people under more careful reflection would maybe donate more um, if they really took the numbers into account because, because of course, behind all these numbers, even though we can't really relate so much to the numbers on an emotional level, if we thought more carefully about it, we would realize that all the numbers matter because behind every number, there's an individual person who we could also identify, we could also come up with a story and a name, etc. But on an emotional level, of course, this is difficult for people. Now, how much did people donate in the third group, where they saw both the photo, the name, and the statistics? So people donated less than in the, in the second group. So, yeah, people really seem to hate statistics. <laughs> okay, so let's look a bit deeper into the cognitive psychology of rationality and irrationality. 
what are sources of irrational thinking and decision-making patterns. And if we understand a bit better how biases emerge, then we're maybe also in a better position to, to see and to judge whether we can improve rationality. According to Keith Stanovich, there are th three sources of irrationality, cognitive miserliness, mindwear gaps, and unhelpful mindwear. And I'll explain each of these terms now, uh, one after the other. So cognitive miserliness. To understand this term, we need to have a quick look at how cognitive psychologists in general explain how we think. And one theory or one very simple model of how we think is the so-called dual process model. And this model um, assumes that we basically can think in two different modes. So this is just a very rough model of how thinking might occur. We can either think in system one mode, and this is characterized by fast, intuitive, automatic, and emotional thinking. So basically, these are our gut reactions. And this type of thinking is the default way of how we think, and it comes very effortless for us. But we can also switch to a system two mode of thinking, which is characterized by slower, deliberate, control, and analytical thinking. So this is reasoning. It's what we usually re refer to as reasoning, and this is much more effortful. Now, most of the time, it's OK to think in system one, because system one yields good answers that help us to achieve our goals. But still, there are many situations where system one doesn't yield good answers, and where, where we have to switch to system two to come up with the right answer and make the right decision. But unfortunately, most of the time, we're too lazy, or it often happens that we're too lazy to switch to system two, even though we should. And yeah, the identifiable victim effect might be an example of this. So here, our gut reaction tells us that we should just help this single identifiable person because we have a strong emotional relation to this person. But um, only if we switch, switch to system two, we will then realize that actually um, all these other individuals that are hidden behind the numbers matter as well, and that they matter equally um, as the person we can identify. Also, the cognitive reflection test. So the bat and the ball example, this is also a good example of our cognitive miserliness, where we are too lazy to switch to system two, even though once we do, it's really easy to solve the answer. But if we don't, we just come up with the wrong answer, and we don't even realize that the answer is wrong. Now, the next source of bias are mindwear gaps. So mindware is software for the mind, so cognitive procedures, algorithms, processes, or thinking tools that we are not equipped with by birth, but that we need to acquire through deliberate learning. And now it can happen that we are in a situation where we have to switch to system two because our system one reaction doesn't yield the right answer. But then when we are in system two, we still cannot answer, the, the, cannot solve the problem appropriately because we're just lacking the right thinking tools to solve the problem. And this is uh, a source of irrationality. And therefore, it's really important to acquire and to learn mindware. So what are some examples of mindware? For example, knowledge about scientific, scientific reasoning. So knowing about what an experiment is, uh, being aware of the fact that correlation is not the same as causation, for example. There are just a lot of important um, implicit or there's a lot of important knowledge that you acquire when you learn about science. Um, probabilistic reasoning as well. So if you think about it throughout history, um, most of the time people didn't know about probability theory, but knowing about probability theory is just really crucial if you want to understand the, the world, the structure of the world, and if you want to navigate through the world. So um, this is just a really important mindware. Also, basic insight into decision theory or game theory can be useful. Economic reasoning, so for example, knowing about opportunity costs or exponential functions. These are all ideas or concepts that don't really come intuitive to us, but they're just really crucial to understand, to know how the world works. And logic um, as well, of course. So. Right, so one source, as I mentioned, of irrationality is 
mindware gaps, so not having the mindware when you need it. And then another source of irrationality is also unhelpful mindware. And this is maybe particularly tragic, so this occurs in cases where you successfully switch to system two, you successfully activate mindware, but the mindware that you activate is not really helpful to solve this problem that you need to solve now. Maybe because it's based on wrong premises, so examples are superstitious thinking, pseudoscientific thinking, or belief in folk psychology, etc. Okay, so now that we have a better understanding of how irrationality can come about, we can also better judge whether we can teach rationality and whether we can improve our own rationality. And I think that this is possible. Um, I know that this is maybe somewhat a controversial claim because there's no, not so much systematic research yet, but I'm uh, relatively optimistic and I'll present three different types of methods of improving our rationality. One is knowledge about biases, debiasing techniques, and acquir acquiring mindware. So first, knowledge about biases. There are a number of studies that show that just by making people aware of the fact that they might be prone to certain biases will help them to overcome them. So this, for example, works for framing effects, hindsight bias, outcome effect, and for anchoring to some extent. So I won't go into detail to explain these biases, but you will find a lot of information about them on Wikipedia. And it doesn't, it, though it doesn't work for all biases, so for example, studies have shown that even if you tell people that they're prone to be overconfident, so that they're prone to believe that they're better in something that they actually are, even if you tell them, they still believe that they're better than they actually are. So it doesn't work for all biases, but it's, at least it works for some, and it's, I think, useful to know for which biases it works and for which it doesn't. Now, another method of improving our rationality are so-called debiasing techniques. These are techniques or heuristics that we can um, consciously apply to help us to overcome certain biases. So, for example, um, in situations where we know that we're now really making an important decision, let's say, you know, our career choice or something like that, or the decision where we should donate our money to, and we know that we might be prone to several biases, and then we can consciously apply certain techniques. The, third, the first technique is called thinking the opposite. This is a really simple, straightforward technique, and as the name says, it just, uh, the idea here is, is just that you consciously try to consider the opposite, that you um, think um, what alternative explanations could be or alternative hypotheses. And um, for example, this even works, this technique, for children or for people with low IQ. So studies have shown that just by applying this technique, you can, for example, overcome certain biases, such as confirmation bias, because you consider alternative hypotheses. You can overcome status quo bias or uh, the omission bias. So there are a large number of biases that you can overcome by applying this simple rule. In the context of effective altruism, uh, this rule, I think, can also be useful. So for example, when we consider where we should donate our money to, we should also then think uh, you know, what other alternatives uh, we, could, we could be um, focusing on, which other causes might be important than the causes that we currently focus on. The next technique is called take the outside view. And here the idea is that you when you're faced with a certain problem, that you try to look at the problem from a third person point of view. So that you, um, an, an example here would be um, the, when you were planning something, so let's say you're planning to organize a conference, then there is a bias which is called planning fallacy, which makes us all prone to make really bad estimates because people usually underestimate the amount of time and effort it takes you to organize something or to, to work on a project. Now, here, this debiasing technique could be useful because it could help us to look at this problem from a third person point of view. So instead of asking yourself, how long do I think I need to finish that project, to organize this conference, you could ask the question, how long do I think this person here needs to organize the conference? And then people are much more accurate in estimating because maybe, yeah, then they're not overconfident, and then they're more realistic in estimating how long it will take them. The third technique is called nudging or self-nudging. 
This is, I would maybe say, this is maybe the most effective technique of the ones that I present here. And the idea of notching is to change the decisional environment in such a way so that people more or less automatically will choose the right options by kind of exploiting their biases. And this works both on a personal level, but also on a group or on a societal level. So on a personal level, an example for notching on a personal level would be the following. Let's say you want to become vegetarian, but you find it very difficult. And then one way of dealing with that problem is to change your environment. For example, to move in together with other people into the same flats who are all vegetarian already. And then it's much easier for you to also be vegetarian because, of course, they only buy vegetarian food, they only cook vegetarian, and then it's much easier. So this is a way of notching yourself to change your behavior. Um, this also works on a group level. So one good strategy or one very effective way of notching a whole group is to set up certain norms, social norms. So within the EA movement, for example, within the EA community, there's this norm of donating 10% to effective charities. And I think this is a really effective norm because new people that join the EA community, then they will maybe also to some extent experience this almost a social pressure that it's a good idea to donate as well, and that it's a good idea to donate to 10%. Um, with some colleagues, together with some colleagues, I conducted a small and very simple study where we wanted to test the um, the effect that the default bias can have on donations. So default bias is the, a bias which leads us to choose the default option. Out of all, out of all the options, we're prone to choose the, the, the one option that is classified as the default as opposed to other options. So what we did is we had um, several people complete a number of tasks, and then at the end of the study, we asked them whether they wanted to donate a certain amount of their payment to effective charities. And now we split the group, we, we split, split the people into two groups. For one group of the people, this option of donating was already pre-selected. So basically it was on, on the computer, on the computer screen, and then there was a checkbox, and this checkbox was already ticked on. And for the other group, the checkbox was not ticked on, so they had to actively click on the checkbox. So this, this small difference made a really huge effect. Uh, so we observed that in the group where they had to actively click on the box, only 20% donated, and in the group where it was already checked on, 80% donated. So it's a really strong effect size. Um, and so this is the power of notching. Okay, the third method of improving our rationality, I, I also think it, this is a really effective way of improving our rationality, is mindware, learning about mindware. So we already, I already talked about mindware. Basically, there are two ways. We can acquire helpful mindware. We can learn about probability theory. We can learn about decision theory and about economic reasoning and scientific reasoning. And just by doing so, I think we'll, we're in a better position to understand how the world works and to navigate the world. And of course, we should also be careful and avoid unhelpful mindware. So now I want to raise a last question, make a last point namely the question of whether it's even desirable to make society more rational. Because, of course, we don't just want to make anybody more rational. We don't want to make psychopaths more rational in achieving their psychopathic goal. But we want to make people more rational who pursue more or less altruistic goals. So now the question is of whether making people more rational will make them more altruistic or not. And yeah, I think this is a really interesting question, because in theory at least, as I mentioned, in theory, rationality and altruism, or whatever your goal is, is, is totally orthogonal. So you, you can have any kind of goal and be more or less rational. But this is just in theory. And psychologically, empirically, I'm not sure exactly uh, what, what the relation is because between altruism and rationality. Um, I think here things are much more complicated because, yeah, if you make people more rational, they will probably also, um, it will also affect many other aspects of their psychology. So I don't really know what the right answer is. So here um, I, looked a bit, I looked this up and I found some studies which seem to suggest that making people more rational might make them more selfish. So for example, economic students are more selfish as a number of studies show. 
And I also uh, was surprised to see that this is not just a correlation, but it's actually a causation. Um, but still, I'm quite cautious in interpreting this because, of course, there are a lot of confounding factors here. And yeah, economic reasoning is just one important aspect of rational thinking, but there's much more to it, of course. So I'm not sure how to interpret this, but it's interesting. So I would probably assume that making people more rational will also make them more open-minded and will also make them more receptive to moral argument. And by doing so, they will probably also become more rational, uh, more altruistic. So I think maybe this was the case for a lot of people here in this room, that via reasoning, via rational reasoning, they maybe also became more altruistic and more interested in, in effective altruism. Now, an interesting uh, perspective is also if we look at this question from a historic or social point of view, from a, yeah, from a historic point of view, because here if we look at humanity over history, then we'll see that over the millennia and centuries and decades, people became more rational and also more altruistic. So at least on a social, on a group level, so on a societal level, there is a correlation between rationality and, and altruism, it seems. But here again, maybe one could counter-argue and could say, well, maybe people didn't really become more altruistic. Maybe we just became better at incentivizing everybody to cooperate because this also makes more sense from a selfish point of view. So, yeah, I'm not really sure what the conclusion is. Um, for this question, but it seems really important to solve before we start to make everybody more rational. Okay, to conclude, yeah, so we are facing really important and difficult moral problems, and it's really important that we don't make a mistake because so much is at stake. And yeah, I, what I was trying to show you in this talk is that intelligence which is usually considered to be the standard for good thinking, is maybe not the right um, framework that we should be thinking in. Instead, I think we should focus on rationality because this is actually, um, I would say, the relevant, the, these are the relevant criteria we should be focusing on and we should be able to measure rationality. There are some first attempts of doing that and by being able to reliably measure rationality, we're then also in a position to um, to select for rationality, and this seems something uh, it's something that's probably really important. So imagine how the world would be like if you couldn't become a medical doctor, if you believed in, in pseudoscientific theories, for example, or imagine how the world would be if you had to complete a rationality test before you were allowed to become the US president. Mm -hmm. I think the world would be very different. And of course, by being able to measure it, we can then also um, identify the best and most effective um, interventions to improve rationality. Yeah, I also think that improving rationality, if we decide that this is a desirable strategy, could, put, could act as a, as a huge leverage effect, could have a huge leverage effect, because by making people more rational, you enable them to solve many more problems in a more effective way. So action points, things that we can do now. So I think, as I mentioned, we need much more research. We need, to be, you know, we need to be able to better measure rationality and improve it. And we also need to know whether it's actually desirable to improve rationality in society. But I think it's safe to say that for us, for people who identify as altruists or effective altruists, it's probably a good idea to make us ourselves more rational. And there are many ways of how we can do that. I presented some ideas. Um, there's also an organization, an EA organization, which focuses on that. It's called the Center for Applied Rationality, or CIFAR in short. And they also develop techniques um, that will help us to become more rational. And I can recommend that you check them out online. Yeah, then I can also recommend some books. So one book is called Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. Uh, the next book is called What Intelligence Tests Miss? The Psychology of Rational Thought by Keith Stanovich. This is a really cool book. Um, and then the last book is called Thinking and Deciding by psychologist Jonathan Barron. That's it. Thank you so much for listening. Um, thank you. Thank you for that talk. Um,
Great. Uh, so we've now I've got time for um, a couple of questions, uh, if you don't mind taking them. Uh, great. So the gentleman in the front row. <coughs> Thank you. Um, my question is, uh, according to you, what is the simplest way how to increase the RQ among general public? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really unsure. So I would say that notching is probably one of the most effective way. Uh, but I mean, by notching people, you're not necessarily improving their RQ, right? Because yes. they don't even realize, but we can just help them to make better decisions. So I would say maybe the most effective intervention to help people to make better, better decisions is notching. And to improve their RQ, I'm not really sure. I would maybe say that, yeah, one thing we should be doing is we should include this research on human decision making and human behavior and on cognitive biases in our school curriculum. So imagine how the world would be if in school you had a subject where all children would learn about all these biases, the world would be completely different. Yes. So like the teacher, you know, the first class in school would be the teacher would enter the classroom and would say, hello everybody, uh, I'm sorry to have to tell you but you have all really bad brains unfortunately, but luckily there's a lot of research of how we can improve it. And in the same way as playing the piano is really difficult at first. If you really, really practice a lot, you can become really good at it. And I think maybe this is similar with thinking. And uh, is there any projects uh, on that, like any pilots uh, for subject uh, at school for improving RQ? Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, um, I'm not aware well, of it. So Actually, I think. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I, I think I can I'm answer <laughs> answer that because yeah, I sure. think I, I know of one project that is, um, I think, about to start um, soon. Uh, there's a guy in Vienna who's uh, trying to found um, an experimental school, an experimental high school, where he would employ um, teaching rationality. So cool. that it might it might be um, it might actually exist in the future. Um, if I can uh, just uh, continue with the uh, nudging thing you, mm -hmm. you mentioned, um, can you give us any examples of like any large-scale nudging projects, for example, that could be um, an example of, of an intervention in public policy where, uh, where it was really effective? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, I think one good example is organ donation. So I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but I think in Austria, like more than 90% or like 97% of all people donate their organs or are okay with their organs being donated. And in Germany, I think it's like 17%. And this is really weird because those are like our two countries which are really similar and their cultures are very similar. And the reason is because in, in Austria, the default option is to donate your organs. And if you don't want that, you have to act, you have to fill out the form or something like that and specifically say, oh, I don't want my organs to be donated. And in Germany, it's the other way around. So here again, it's just this default bias, which has a huge, uh, huge effect. And yeah, just by changing the default, we can save yeah, hundreds or thousands of, of lives. Yeah, I think the Czech Republic is, is lucky enough to have the uh, default option to, to oh, give, that's great, give yeah. the give Actually, the in Switzerland, where I come from, they, they just had the debate in the, in the national parliament about exactly this question, and they decided against it. I have no idea why, but... Yeah, they have decided that it shouldn't be the default option. That seems really, like a really bad decision. Yeah, sorry to hear about that. Yeah. Um, Maybe we should teach them rationality. Exactly, yeah, somebody yeah, teach, go there and give Teach them the Swiss rationality, that's a great idea. Okay, um, we'll take uh, more questions. Yeah, um, there in the, uh, in the middle. Uh, gentleman in the blue t-shirt, I believe. Yeah, hello. My question is about the rationality test. I want to ask, for example, IQ, IQ tests, they are very popular. And I think that you can actually train, train to be better in IQ tests. The reason, in my opinion, the, re the reason is that you use some way of thinking to be good in IQ tests. And, my, and for example, uh, the, as uh, your example about baton, baton ball, I saw something similar before. So it was quite easy for me to solve it because I just knew I just knew the the trick. Mm. And my question is, if you if you think that it's able to design a test that is variable enough that you uh, you cannot train for it, because I can imagine once rationality rationality test will be popular, 
then people will be able to train for to train for it. So that's it. Yeah, I agree. This is a really it's a really good question, and it's I agree that it's very very difficult to measure rationality mm, because yeah, as you mentioned, if you already know of the type of questions, then because often as we saw in these brain teaser questions. The, the difficulty is to be aware of the fact that you need to be cautious and of what kind of things you need to be cautious. And if you know about these uh, pitfalls, then you're able to perform much better, right? But it doesn't necessarily mean that you're better in life in general. So yeah, I agree that this is like something that is inherently difficult then to measure. And um, yeah, I don't really know. I'm sure, yeah, Keith Stanovich, the one who developed this test, um, thought about this as well. But yeah, I mean, in general, you just, if if everybody knows about the type of questions, then you need to come up with new tests, of course. So this is just a general problem that also is the case for IQ, IQ tests. But I would, I would agree that maybe with RQ tests, it's even more difficult. Um, yeah, I don't really know what the best answer is. You just, we probably need to constantly develop new tests uh, and try to find ways to where we can measure people's rationality without uh, them g giving them the possibility to cheat and to hack it somehow. Yeah, but oh, the, there's also another point I want to make, namely that, so you mentioned that people can become better in IQ tests just by tr practicing for them, and I think this is true, but still, I think in general, um, impr improving your IQ, improving your intelligence, is much more difficult than improving your rationality, because um, intelligence is to a large extent also ch genetically determined, and even though, of course, you can practice for certain tests, you still have just limitations, cognitive limitations, because you're just maybe not able to hold more information in your working memory, or because your thinking is just too slow, and then at some point you cannot improve it further. But rationality, I think, is much easier to teach and to improve, because, yeah, as we, as we saw, you can just learn about biases, you can acquire a mindware, and everybody can do that, even if you don't even have a particularly high IQ. So I think this is kind of good news, because everybody, just by learning about these biases and the acquiring the mindware, can improve their RQ score maybe by several several standard deviations. Just in like, you know, half a year, read all these books, and then you're just way more rational than before. And this is it's really encouraging, I think. Yeah. Right, next question. Um, the lady in the back. Thank you. Hello. Does it work? Yeah, it mm -hmm. works. Uh, do you really think that rationality is universal? Because for me, it, it doesn't sound like it, but still, for me, rationality is by definition something pluralistic because everyone has like different moral background and moral ideas. So for many people, what seems what seem to be rational for other people don't have to be. So do you really think that it's something that we can teach, that there's just one rationality, that only this person is rational and the other one is not because well, he's behaving in a different way than we think it's right? Um, yeah, I would say that at least some aspects of rationality, namely epistemic rationality, where the idea is to form accurate beliefs about the world, I think this is something that's probably um, useful for every person, no matter what your goal are, what your goal is, it's important to have an ac accurate model about the world. And then here, I think we can teach exactly the same to everybody. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I would say that in general, you can teach rationality in an abstract way so that it's useful really for everybody. But then, yeah, I would agree, of course, that um, when things get much more concrete and then you have maybe different people or different groups which have very specific goals, then maybe you can teach rationality or certain aspects of rationality in a more specific way. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, well, let's go. Let's go there. Uh, in the middle. In the middle. Um, gentleman in the middle. Yep. Uh, hello, Lucius. Uh, thank you for a great talk. You devoted a big part of your talk to disrationality. This. This. What's the word? <laughs> Disrationalia. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and uh, I have a short question. Um, do you think that um, an opposite for that exists? Like, uh, dysrationalia is when you have high IQ, but low RQ, right? And do you think that uh, low, uh, low IQ can exist uh, in a person who has high RQ? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. Yeah, uh, so I don't know what the answer is, 
I mean, now that we have the RQ test, it would be relatively easy to find out, right? Um, but I could imagine that maybe you need to have at least a certain, you need to fulfill a certain level of intelligence in order even to understand, for example, a lot of the mind where these thinking tools, you know, maybe you just don't understand them um, if you are just, if your IQ score is too low. Because maybe, yeah, your working memory capacity is just too small and then you cannot really, it's, it's, it's like, you know, if you have a software with really um, very old hardware, then you cannot install, uh, if you have a computer, then you cannot install the really cool software on it. <laughs> um, but I'm not sure, but I would um, assume that yes, of course, you can have people with relatively low IQ but high RQ, but maybe there's a certain threshold that you need to fulfill, but I don't know. Would be cool to find out. Yeah. Right, um, another question. Um, lady here in the in front. Good evening, thank you for your talk. As you mentioned in your talk, uh, the thing that happened with George Bush. And nowadays, I think in political, in politics, it's happening even more things. And I would like to ask you if you think it is because of the low IQ of people or because of the low RQ. And if you think it's some, it's something called political RQ exists, and if there are some different ways to raise political RQ. Thank you. Mm. What, so what do you think a political RQ would be? What would it measure? I don't know if rationality itself can help make people write political decisions because from my point of view, it acquires some knowledge about politics itself. But from my point of view, it's something that's really, really important in today's world because people are irrational in the very important ch chooses that they make in political life because mm -hmm. politics normally lead the world and politics lead the country. Mm -hmm. And if we have so irrational choose for the one of for the most important countries in the world, I think it is, it's really, a really bad situation. Uh -huh. um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, so I would probably say that uh, many of the problems in politics are due to, yeah, irrationality. So I think I would agree with that and that politics would be much better if politicians uh, or everybody was more rational and had higher RQ. Um, but it might also be, of course, there are also value differences So in politics. So some people might just be, politicians might be less broadly altruistic than others. So there is maybe it's not just rationality, but there maybe also are value differences that play a role. And um, yeah, so I w it would be really cool if yeah, maybe politicians had to complete an RQ test, a political RQ test. But yeah, I'm not sure how exactly to do that. And of course, there might also be dangers in, in introducing such, such tests. Um, yeah. Right. Um, thank you for all that. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, more time for questions. But thank you again, Lucius. It was a great talk. Thank you again. Thanks. Thanks.